Good morning, everybody. Today we will be discussing about the analysis of swimming movements. Everybody will be knowing the swimming is considered to be best, one of the best exercise a man can do. A recent study done in United States of America says that most of the people swim for, for fun and enjoyment. That is, most of the swimmers are recreational swimmers. And a 15 percentage of the people swim for fitness level, to improve their fitness level, because it is a one of the best fitness exercise available. And, and around a 13 percentage of the people swim, do, does swimming for a competitive purpose, to improve their swimming acti activities. And an 8 percentage of the people swim to find out new friends and to meet new people. Now, a total, we will we'll be discussing about the swimming, com, regarding the competitive swimming right now. For a total time, time for race is the sum of three things. That is a starting time, a stroke time and turning time. So, once we consider it, T total is T start plus T stroke plus T turn. Again, again stroke will be there, again turn will be there again stroke will be there. So, a total time, race time is the combination of starting time, stroking time and turning time. And the starting time con again consists of three parts, that in which include block time, flight time and glide time. Block time means, once the starting signal is given, until the foot leaves the block, that time is called block time. And once the foot leaves the block, the person will be in the air and that time, the once the person will be in the air, it, that time is called block flight time. So, the once the person is in the air, that time is called flight time. That is, foot leaves the ground until the foot contact with the water, that time is called flight time. And the third is the glide time. Once the foot or the body part contact with the water and the beginning of the stroke or kick, that time period is called glide time. Among all these start time, the glide time is having the longest duration. Now, glide time is the most among the three determining starting time and glide time depends upon two things. First one is the glide distance and the second one is average glide speed. Now, stroke time. Stroke time depends upon two things. The first one is the speed of the swimmer in that distance and the distance he has to swim. So, stroke time depends upon the distance involved and speed of the swimmer. The speed of the swimmer is the product of average stroke length and average stroke frequency. Average stroke length means total distance stroke divided by number of complete arm cycle. And average stroke frequency means number of complete arm cycles divided by time spent for stroking. Now, once we, once the swimming, competitive swimming, there are two types of forces acting on a swimmer. The first type of force is the propulsive force, which helps the swimmer to move forward. These are called propulsive forces. Second one is resistive forces or repulsive forces which stop the forward movement or which resist the forward movement of the swimmer. The propulsive forces are mainly two. The first one is the movement of his arms and the second one is the movement of the legs. So, the movement of the arm regards as the prime source of forward propulsion, but in most of the cases, the movement of the arm is the, is the primary source of the forward propulsion. But in case of breaststroke, the work of the legs dominates the movement of the arms. So, according to the Mostard and Jong, force exerted by arm and leg in butterfly stroke were approximately of the same magnitude, but at the same time, the breaststroke leg works, leg works dominates a bit. Now, the kicking of the legs, it aids the production of the propulsive forces and it helps to decrease the resistive forces. 
Now, regarding the resistive forces, there are three types of resistive forces are there in swimming. These are called drags. The three types of drags are there. The first one is form drag, second one is surface drag, and the third one is wave drag. Form drag. Everybody will be knowing as the surface area, the frontal surface area increases, the resistance also increases. So, resistance Form drag means the resistance that result from the shape of an object moving through water. It depends upon the speed of the simmer and the cross sectional area present, uh, present to the oncoming flow. So, decrease the frontal area, surface area is the most likely to mean to decrease the form drag and improve the forward speed. Second type of drag or second type of resistance force is the wave drag. That is, it is due to the some waves, uh, pressure around the simmer due to different water velocities due to the forming formation of the waves. As the speed of the simmer increases, the wave also increases and there will be more resistance. Third type of drag is the surface drag. Surface drag is due to the frictional force between surfaces. That is, the frictional force of the moving body in the water due to interaction between the simmer's body and the water molecule. So, it can be reduced by proper swim suit, swim cap and proper technique and proper preparation. Now, the competitive simmers, once we assess the body of the competitive simmers, their joints, it can, we can see it as, there, they are relatively lax. Competitive simmers are frequently described as being hyper lax. That is, the, their body position consists of typically a forward head, rounded shoulder, lordotic back, hyperextension of the knee. But this laxity enables the, them to move a more range of motion and the laxity may be due to their, their, their vigorous stretching exercises vigorous movement and vigorous stretching programs also. Anyway, vigorous stretching exercise and program has to be incorporated in their exercises, other regular training ex and exercises so that they can move, they can maintain the range of motion and they can improve their uh, competitive uh, activities. Now, we will go through the different types of string sim stock. Recreational sim, in recreational swimming, there are different varieties of swim stroke, but in competitive level of swimming, there are usually four types of swim strokes are available. These are butterfly stroke, freestyle stroke, back stroke, and breast stroke. Now, we will go through a video of different strokes. So, the first one is First one, we can see it is the backstroke. The person will be on the supine lying position and do the strokes. It is the backstroke. And the second one, we can see it is the breaststroke now. This movement is the breaststroke. Now, it is butterfly stroke. Here, you can see a a movement starting from the upper side and moving towards the lower side. Now, the type of stroke is the most common stroke and this is the freestyle stroke. And the movement of the arm and leg, you can see, notice that it is a reciprocal type of movement in the arms and legs. So, this type of stroke is the freestyle stroke and it is the most common type of strokes in the competitive swimming. Now, we will go through the analysis of freestyle stroke. In the freestyle stroke, the motion of the arm is reciprocal. That is, once one arm is in the air, other arm will be in the water. So, the, the reciprocal motion is the peculiarity of freestyle stroke. Arm position marks the different phases of freestyle stroke. Freestyle strokes can be broadly classified into two phases. The first one is a pull-through phase, 
and the second one is recovery phase. Pull through phase means once the arm is in the water, that phase is called pull through phase and once the arm is in the air that is not in the water, that phase is called recovery phase. So, broadly the swimming stroke can be divided, freestyle stroke can be divided into two phases. The first one is pull through phase and the second one is recovery phase. Once the arm is in the water, it is called pull through phase. Now, the pull through phase can be again classified into three phases: early pull through, mid, three, mid pull through and late pull through. So, pull through phase can be classified into three, early, mid and late pull through. Again, recovery phase can be again classified into two, early recovery phase and late recovery phase. Now, the portion of the phase in which hand is under water is called pull through. Now, in the starting of the swimming, hand enters the water forward of and lateral to the head and medial to the shoulders and medial to the shoulders and elbow will be plus and position above the hand so that the fingers are the first enter to water. At that point, hand initiates its S-shaped pattern of movement. So, this initiation of S-shaped pattern of movement is called early pull through. This phase is called early pull through. So, after this initiation of S-shaped pattern, then the hand goes into a most propulsive phase of this swimming. swimming. That is, during the most propuls of the propulsive phase of this swimming, the humerus powerfully adducts and hand crosses the chest. So, at this point, humerus is perpendicular to the body is called mid pull through and later stage or subsequent to this point is called late pull through. Then hand continues and traverses laterally, passes the pelvis under it, exits the water, leading to the little finger, leading with the little finger, and the and the recovery phase starts. And the first stage of the recovery is the early recovery, and later it becomes the late recovery phase. Now the amount of spent time, the amount of time spent in the recovery phase is much shorter than that of the pull through phase because. The one is in the air, the recovery phase is in the air and pull through phase is in the water. So, there is more resistance in the water. So, the amount of time spent in the, the pull through phase will be more when compared to the recovery phase and the purpose of the recovery phase is to bring the arm to the again to the pull through phase for propulsion. Now, this is the moment we discussed about the moment of the upper extremities. Now, the lower extremities also have propulsive function. The lower extremities undergo a kick called flutter kick for it is for especially for propulsion and stabilization. And this flutter kick actually it causes a lots of energy. The energy loss is more in case of flutter kick. So, usually a good athlete or a distance swimmer, usually a distance swimmer or a marathon swimmer tries to minimize the flutter kick in the initial stages of swimming and the athlete can use this flutter kick in the final stage or final strokes so that he can move fast in the final stroke and the guess the get the first position. Now, the swimmers encounters lesser resistance when their body are streamlined horizontally and laterally and this good alignment will be available by positioning the by positioning the body in such a way that it should roll from side to side coincide with the movement of the arm that is roll to the left when the left arm reaches the mid pull through and roll to uh, right when the right arm reaches the mid pull through phase now the breathing pattern of the athletes or swimmers there are different types of breathing patterns are available Usually, the rec there is some difference in the breathing pattern among the recreational and fitness swimmers and competitive swimmers. And in usually, the recreational and fitness swimmers roll their head towards the side of the dominant arm as the arm exits the water. And in case of competitive swimmers, they roll the head alternatively to the right and left side during every third hand exit the water. This is the breathing pattern. So, recreational and fitness swimmers is having one type of breathing pattern and competitive swimmers is having another type of breathing pattern. 
Now, we will start with the next type of stroke is the butterfly. Now, next type of stroke is the butterfly stroke. You can see in the video the butterfly stroke. The difference is in the butterfly stroke is that the movement of the arm is not reciprocal. It is simultaneous and you can see a movement starting from the upper side and goes into the lower side and the kick you can see the name of the kick is called dolphin kick and you can see the S shaped pattern of movement it is a bilateral S shaped pattern of movement can be seen in the case of uh, butterfly stroke. So, it is similar to the the similar to the freestyle stroke and S shaped pattern of pulling it is bit wider and shorter and arm activity is bilateral activity, but in the freestyle stroke we discussed that arm activity is reciprocal in, in case of freestyle stroke here the arm, act, arm activity is bilateral and arm stroke simultaneously and legs, legs kick simultaneously freestyle stroke we studied the movement of the body that is movement of the body as body roll and here there is no body roll also. And breathing the breathing pattern is lifting the head upward and out of the water and take a breath and end entry is wider and exit when the water is earlier. Now, you can see in that picture you might have seen in that picture that is the transfer of the there is transfer of motion from upper extremity to the lower extremities and lower extremities a specific type of kicking both legs kick simultaneously and name of the kick is called a dolphin kick. Legs move up and down two cycles during one complete arm cycle. But so starting with a new type of stroke, it is backstroke. And this is the you can see the video of a backstroke, backstroke swimming here. Here the difference is that the the position of the body, the person will be performing the backstroke in supine position, and the arm stroke, like freestyle stroke, here also arm stroke reciprocally. And the phases are almost similar to the freestyle stroke, there is recovery phase and pull through phases are there, but at the same time the breathing for the breathing pattern there is no specific breathing pattern is not there because main thing is that the head is the face is above the water. So, no need of a specific breathing pattern and the body will be in horizontal alignment with the water and there is only a slight bend you can see at the point of at the waist. Today we discussed about the different biomechanical or different analysis of swimming, the movement analysis of swimming and we have gone through the different swimming strokes, the four types of swimming strokes also and the most common injuries in swimming. Then we discussed about the rehabilitation, preventive and rehabilitation protocol for swimming also and this has to be for further these are the references for the, these are the references and these are some, these are some further reading these books, these are the some further read. In this session we will be discussing about the analysis of throwing motion. So, everybody will be knowing all of us know that throwing is the one of the major component in almost all the sporting activities. Either it is American football or basketball or baseball or uh, volleyball and all, all these things throwing motion almost similar type of throwing motion cricket also you can see almost a similar type of throwing motion or throwing pattern. So, throwing pattern entire in, in different sports we can classify into three types of throwing pattern. First one is an overarm throwing or an, or, or an overhead throwing, an overarm throwing or overhead throwing. Second one is a side arm throwing and the third one is an underarm throwing. Three types of throwing mat pattern can be seen in different sports. The first one is an overarm throwing. Overarm throwing there is some difference in the position of the trunk also. In case of an overarm throwing, the hand position, the hand and trunk, the trunk will move away from the hand. So, this is the pattern of an overarm throwing that is the trunk will move away from the hand position or the trunk rotation opposite side of trunk rotation from the side of the hand is there in the case of overarm throwing. And in case of side arm throwing, the trunk rotation will be the trunk will rotate towards the same side of the, the hand, hand that is this is the side arm throwing and the next one is an underarm throwing. In case of an un, uh, underarm throwing, 
there is no much movement of the trunk. So, three types of throwing pattern can be seen in case of uh, in different sports. The first one is an overarm throwing where the trunk moves away from the uh, away from the hand and in case of side arm throwing the trunk will move towards the side of throwing and in underarm throwing there is no much changes in the changes in the position of the trunk. Now, usually different sports is having different objectives in throwing activities. Some sports requires some sports in some throwing requires maximum distance. The first objective may be one oh, one is a maximum distance. The second another objective may be maximum accuracy where the distance no matters. Accuracy is important in another in some other sports activities in throwing. And the some in some cases you can see along with the speed, along with the distance, along with the speed, accuracy is also important. Here, the speed along with the accuracy is, is also important in some cases of throwing. Now, there are different factors which determine each thing. For example, if a maximum distance, if to attain, to attain a maximum distance, there are certain factors which influence the maximum distance. It includes the release velocity or release speed, release angle, release height and aerodynamics. These are the factors which influence or which are the determining factors of maximum distance. Now, everybody will be knowing as the release great speed or greater relief velocity will give, give a greater distance. As the relief, relief, release speed increases or release velocity increases, the greater the distance also increases. This is the first determining factor. So, what is happening is that when the release height and angle are kept constant, constant, if we are keeping the other factors constant and release speed or release velocity is the determining factor of the distance or both vertical and, and horizontal displacement of the projectile. Now, once the, the ball is released from the hand, it goes into, it produces a constant acceleration or deceleration. Uh, the gravity produces, there will be a constant acceleration or deceleration by the gravity, deceleration by the gravity and the ball or the object take a path of parabola. There will be a parabolic path in case of once the, once the ball is released from the hand, gravity decelerate the motion and the ball take a motion, parabolic motion. Now, release angle. Release angle can be defined as the angle between the projectile velocity vector and the horizontal at the instant of release. This is the release angle. So, there will be an optimum release angle which gives the maximum distance. So, that, th that we will discuss later and next is the release height. Release height means greater the release height, there will be greater distance. That is, the movement will be more in case of greater release height. Now, we already discussed that as the speed increases, range also increases or release height increases, range increases, but release angle. Release angle, we discussed that it should be optimum. Then, what is the optimum release angle? Optimum release angle, if the release height is 0, it is exactly what we already studied in 12 standard that uh, for if the release height is 0, then the release angle should be will be 45, the optimum release angle is 45 degree which gives the maximum distance. But in most of the uh, players or most of the throwing activities, release height will be more than that, more than 0. So, release height won't be 0, it is the height of the release, release height is the height of the release. So, release height won't be 0 in most of the throwing activity. So, then there will be an optimum release angle in that. So, in case of short putters, lots of research is saying that a 42 degree release height is maximum in case of max, it gives a maximum displacement in case of short putters. But these things, we studied the four, four methods of four factors which influence the, uh, the distance. But these are not only these are the these are not the only things which decide the maximum performance. There are other factors also, like the strength of the muscle. The, the there are lots of other factors like strength of the muscle, etc., which 
we decide the release distance also. Now, the second phase is the second one is the second aim of objective of throwing is the to attain the maximum accuracy. There are two determining factors which influence the maximum accuracy. That is the first one is the release point and second one is throwing arc. Release point for usually the ball follows the path. Release point is the point at which the ball is released. That is the ball follows a path that is tangent to the release point on the arc of throwing motion. So, if I want to throw that distance, the release point should be here and if I want to throw this point, the release height should be at the release uh, point should be here. So, the release point is a determining factor for the accuracy and next one is the throwing arc, it, at which arc it is throwing, whether it is a high long arc or a small arc and this is the another factor which is determining the accuracy of throwing. Now, we will go through analysis of throwing motion. So, which are the, we will be in this heading, we will be discussing about the different phases of throwing and what are the activities, what is the position of each joint in this throwing. So, throwing activities can be divided into six phases. The first one is the wind up phase, then stride phase, arm cocking phase, arm acceleration phase, arm deceleration phase and follow through phase. These are the six phases, that is wind up phase, stride phase, arm cocking phase, arm acceleration phase, arm deceleration phase and follow through phase are the six different phases of throwing. You can see in this picture the different phases. Now, we will start with the first phase that is wind up phase. Wind up phase means it may, it can be defined as it is the position from first movement until the hand separate. Here we are taking the baseball pitching for the reference of throwing. That is why this, uh, this position is considered as from the mo uh, first movement until the hand separates. So, wind up phase can be defined as the phase where from first movement until the hand separates. That is the position will be like this, the, the, the position will be like this and the lead leg lift and hip with, with knee flexion at the hip and knees and lead side, this is the, if I am throwing that side, this is the lead side and the lead side faces the target and all the weight will be placed on the stance leg. Now, this is the balanced position prior to hand separation and lead leg lifting is done by the concentric contraction of the hip flexors. So, again we will go through what is wind up phase, it is the starting position, it is the from the first movement until the hand separates, lead leg lifts and the all the weight will be on the uh, stance leg and lead leg faces the lead side, faces the target and this is a balanced position prior to hand separation and lead leg lifting is done by concentric contraction of the hip flexors. Now, stance leg at the same time, stance leg bends slightly by the contraction, eccentric contraction of the quadriceps, quadriceps. Now, the position of the shoulder, shoulder will be partially flexed and abducted. This is, this will be the position of the shoulder. The position will be partially flexed. It is partially flexed and abducted. This will be the position of the shoulder and elbow will be in ice in mild reflection by the isometric L by the action of isometric elbow flexors. Now, the second phase is the stride phase. In this phase, so phase starts from hand separation until the lead foot contact the ground. The lead foot was uh, flexed and it was lifted. Now, from the hand separation until the lead foot contact the ground, this is this phase is called stride phase. So, lead leg begins to fall and move in this phase, the lead leg begins to fall and move towards the target. Now, there will be hip abduction followed by knee and hip extension of the stance leg and stance leg remains contact with the ground. There will be eccentric contraction of the hip flexors and concentric contraction of the hip, uh, con concentric contraction of the stance leg hip abductors which lengthen the stride. Along with, the, along with that lead leg rotate, external rotation of the lead leg 
an internal rotation of the stance hip. There will be external rotation of the lead hip, hip and internal rotation of the stance hip will be there. And two types of stance can be seen. It is a closed stance or on an open stance. Now, regarding the movement of the shoulder, there will be the it was shoulder was partially flexed and abducted. Now, there will be more abduction of the shoulder and starting of external rotation of the shoulder and horizontal abduction of the shoulder and elbow, wrist and fingers goes into an extension. Next phase is the third phase is the arm cocking phase. Arm cocking phase starts from the here the lead foot contact the ground and the shoulder reaches its maximum external rotation. In this, in this phase, the upper body, upper side, upper torso is target the face. Up to this time, the lead side was target, targeting the, uh, the face of the target. Now, the upper torso or upper body faces the target at this point. So, arm cocking phase where the lead foot is in contact with the ground to, till the max, there is maximum external rotation of the shoulder and upper body target the shoulder. There will be internal rotation of the uh, internal rotation of the hip and the trunk rotators are placed on stretch. So, this in this case it produces a recoil effect for subsequent shoulder rotation and there will be hyper extension of the lumbar trunk which there will be there will be hyper extension of the lumbar trunk and there will be stretching of the abdominal and oblique muscles at this phase, arm cocking phase. Next phase is the arm acceleration phase. So, in the arm cocking phase, the shoulder has reached into a maximum external rotation and from this maximum external rotation until the ball release. So, the once there is maximum external rotation, there is prayer to maximal external rotation elbow goes into an extension and the starting of an internal rotation and from the starting of an internal rotation or maximum external rotation until the ball release this phase is called arm acceleration phase. Here there is fairly muscle less muscle activity, but all the energy will be released at this point of time and prior to maximum external rotation there is elbow extension and immediate onset of internal rotation done by subscapularis, latissimus dorsi and pectoralis major muscles. The trunk are, were extended, now the trunk flexors starts working, trunk flexors goes into a forward flexion from the hyper extended position and reaches into a neutral position by the help of trunk flexors. Now, the lead knee begins to straighten providing a stable base of support. Next phase of throwing is the arm deceleration phase. In arm acceleration phase, ball the, the it is the point up to the ball release. Arm acceleration phase, arm deceleration phase is from the ball release until the maximum shoulder external rota internal rotation. So, arm deceleration phase is from ball release till shoulder reaches its maximum internal rotation. So, in the last phase, the trunk was going into flexion and it reaches the neutral position from hyper extended position and trunk continue its flexion and lead knee, lead knee and throwing elbow continue its extension. Lead knee and throwing elbow continue its extension. Then stance leg moves upwards in reaction to the flexion of the trunk. Stance, stance leg moves upward, there is internal rotation of the shoulder until the internal rotation reaches its 0 degree and there is pronation of the radio ulnar joint. The next phase is the follow through phase. Follow through phase is the phase is the last phase of throwing. Follow through phase starts from maximum internal rotation until the player reaches a balanced position. So, this is the follow through phase, we will go through each phases again. The first phase is the winder phase, winder phase, 
wind up phase is the phase where the starting of the from the first motion until the hand separate and the second phase is the stride phase stride phase is from hand separation until the lead foot contact the ground and the third phase is the arm cocking phase arm cocking phase is the phase from the lead foot contact the ground until the shoulder reaches its maximum external rotation and arm acceleration phase is the from maximum shoulder external rotation until the ball release the next phase is the arm deceleration from ball release until the until the shoulder reaches its maximum external rotation and next phase is the follow through phase from maximum external rotation until the player until the player is in balanced position these are the different six phases of throwing now we will go through some common injuries in throwing the first and the most important is the instability of shoulder usually an anterior instability of shoulder is common mainly because of arm cocking phase in the arm cocking phase the shoulder reaches its maximum external rotation and abduction and this is the phase where the, there is more chance of stress on the anterior side of the shoulder and there is more chance of an anterior dislocation of the shoulder if the, the, the person does not have enough muscle strength and stabilization and this is a phase there is more chance of anterior shoulder instability and stretching of the anterior side and there is at the late cocking phase there is in the in the DC arm deceleration phase there is more chance of an posterior instability of the shoulder next type of injury seen are rotator cuff injuries and tears and which later leads to an impingement syndrome also the rotator cuff muscles are four muscles which which is around the uh, glenoid glenoid cavity and glenoid labrum so that the main function of this rotator cuff muscle is to keep the humerus uh, the to keep the it is these are the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder so that it keeps the humerus in proper position during different movements so that dislocation can be avoided so once there is an overuse of this rotator cuff muscle there is chance of injury there is chance of micro trauma also and in case of any difficulty or any injury to the rotator cuff muscles this sometimes this rotator cuff muscle can be impinged between the humor uh, by the humeral head and this condition is called impingement syndrome and another common injury is during throwing is the ulnar collateral ligament injury of the elbow so again like any other injuries like any other uh, program like any other exercise program or any other competitive programs this also the throwing also has to be taken care of uh, properly that is proper strengthening exercise and stretching exercise has to be done and the proper prevention proper prevention has to be done that is which include the different stretching program and strengthening program of the shoulder muscles and back muscles etc which improve the shoulder performance along with that injury prevention can be done so proper strengthening and stretching program and proper warm up before any activity has to be done which prevent the strengthening which prevent the injuries of the uh, during throwing so this also has to be taken care of all by the uh, by the athletes coaches and trainers etc so today's topic we already we discussed about the throwing pattern and the common injuries of the throwing etc will be discussing about the components of a skill in order to do activity or a skill a lot of coordinated activity of a lot of system has to be there it includes neuro even neuromuscular um, neuromuscular system especially neuro neuro uh, nervous system the muscular system the skeletal system all this cardiovascular system all this system work together and do an activity or a skill now the first and the foremost thing for a skill is the neuromuscular coordination itself 
the another important factors we are discussing in this session regarding some important factors which helps uh, which we component component for a skip so other factors are the flexibility of the muscle strength of the muscle agility power endurance a cardiovascular system balance and speed these are the common which are these are the different components for a skip now the first and the foremost thing is the neuromuscular coordination we have a nervous system which uh, which take the senses from the receptors it receive the senses and depends upon what type of uh, what type of senses received it it goes through the afferent afferent uh, pathway and reaches the central nervous system and depends upon what are what are the previous experiences and the previous experiences it decide the motor action so for in order to do a skill the all this pathway should be clear that like receptors may the it may be a special sensors or it may be the other receptors it may be a pain receptor or it may be a special sensors like hearing or vision whatever the sensors it passes through the afferent nervous system so receptor should be clear the afferent nervous system the afferent pathway should be clear and the central nervous system there, there should be a proper coordination from the central nervous system and depends upon what is the previous experience and depends upon that previous experience the central nervous system decide what action has to be taken within it, all this activity goes within a, within seconds and depends upon what activity has to be taken so uh, it and it gives information to the motor neuron and motor uh, motor pathway and through the motor pathway it reaches to the muscles and what action has to be taken depends upon the muscle contracts and the the activity is done so the first and foremost thing is the neuromuscular coordination or coordination that is coordination can be defined as an ability to use the senses together with the body parts with the movements and the second one is the even if we are having the proper coordination the next one is the flexibility flexibility can be defined as according to zaka zuski it is flexibility can be defined as the ability of the muscle to lengthen allowing one joint or more than one joint in a series to move through a range of motion that is the for a flexible muscle means a flexible joint means it has to go it has to Uh, move it in its full range of motion and according to holland in 1968 he he, he described flexibility as is as a characteristic characterized by the ability of the muscle to relax and yield a stretch force and also a range of motion available in a joint or a group of joint so in summary we can say if the flexibility of is the range of motion that is the muscle has to move the joint has to move in its full range of motion then only a skill or a proper activity can be done so there are lots of things lots of we can check the flexibility by using lots of measurements lots of tools are there and if there is less flexibility there are lots of drills or lots of activities like stretching activities to improve the flexibility next most important thing is the agility that is agility means the ability to change the direction of while during a movement that is agility can be defined as ability to change and control the direction and position of the body while maintaining a constant rapid motion so again especially in the sport skills so agility is important that is for example while a person is playing tennis he has to change the direction depends upon the ball where he has to hit so he change keep on changing the direction and this is called exactly called agility the trainers recommends or physio recommends that agility exercise has to be performed in the warm up and in the uh, during but for uh, through the warm up and at the start of the each session each session or each period the agility exercises has to be started but agility exercises should not be it should not indent the physic it should not be physically exhausting next important uh, component of a skill is the balance balance can be defined as ability to control or stabilize the body when a person is standing or moving the balance may be a static balance or a dynamic balance that is when the person is standing or sitting so he, there should be a balance while that balance is entirely different from a person who is running a person who is moving so it may be it is a it either it may be a dynamic balance 
or a static balance. Again, in order to in order to stabilize for this, this stabilization or controlling of the balance, there again there are lots of activities like there are lots of system works, especially the new nervous system and the muscular system, will coordinate and makes a the proper balance. Next component of a skill which is important for the sports is the speed. Speed is the the definition of speed is the ability is the ability to move the body parts or the body itself swiftly. So many sports rely on speeds to gain the advantage over your opponent. That is now it is the time of that is uh, it is the time of speed and most of the the speed is the main advantage given uh, to the that is if the speed once the person is can do the things so fast or this especially in sports he will be having an advantage for example a basketball player making a fast break to perform a layup or a tennis a tennis player moving forward and get a drop shot or a football player outrunning the defenses to receive a pass so here the speed for that skill the speed is important now next one is power Power is the ability to move the body parts swiftly while applying the maximum force. So speed should be there and along with that muscle strength should be there. So power can be defined as a combination of, it, we can say it's a combination of speed and strength. That is the body part, body part has to be moved fastly along with that with maximum force. So for example, full back in football muscling their way through the other player and speeding to advance the ball. A volleyball player getting up to the net and lifting their bodies to the high in the air. These are the example of power. Now, in order to improve this, these skills, there are lots of activities usually done. The first, most, the first important activity usually done is the shuttle runs. Shuttle, uh, the shuttle run is standard agility and speed drills used by the athletes whose place to stop and go sports, especially soccer, hockey, basketball, tennis. That is, especially it improves this shuttle runs, improves the agility. Now, other type of drills are the ladder drills are there. High knee lift through the ladder. That is, coordinate your arm with your legs and drive back uh, this backward and forward to boost the speed. Push your legs back down, back down towards the ground from the hips in a pistoning action. Keep the chest elevated, land on the ball of the foot. Next type of drill, ladder drill is the lateral step through ladder. That is lateral stepping by name itself we can understand that. Lower your center of gravity and step one foot on each rung of the ladder and keep on the balls of your feet to keep and keep low and perform right and left. That is lateral uh, step through ladder. Next type is the hop stop drill. That is starts with your feet hip uh, feet hip width uh, width apart at the bottom of the ladder. Jump up with the both feet and land on the left foot only in the first square. Immediately push off your left foot and land with the both feet in the second square. Immediately then push off the push off with both feet and land on the right side right or the uh, right foot only and push off your right foot and land on both feet and repeat this pattern full length of the ladder. Next is in and out drills. That is first of all the person is standing outside the ladder then he enters inside the ladder with both legs. Then in the next stage he is, uh, he is spreading his leg and standing outside that is uh, running out standing outside the ladder and again he is closing his leg both legs and comes back that is start with your feet hip width apart at the bottom of the ladder step into the first square with your left foot first and immediately followed by your right foot now with your left foot step outside to the left left to the second square then immediately step outside out the second square with your right foot now step back to the third square with your left foot first followed by your right foot repeat this pattern in fluid motion throughout the length of the ladder next type of drill is the lateral feet drill in this start with the both feet outside the first square 
and to the left. Then step into the first square with your left foot first and followed by your right foot in very fast. Step to the right outside first square, outside the square and again the left, uh, uh, step to the right side of the square with the left foot first followed by the right foot. Now step diagonally to the left into the second square with the left foot leading always keeping the in the same 1 2 motion. Now step outside the left outside to the left hand side on the second square and repeat the full length of the ladder. If you perform the several set of these drills start at different side of the ladder and uh, so your lead foot changes each time. Next type of drill is the tango drill that is starts with both feet outside the first square and left. Then cross the left leg over the right and into the center of the first square. Your right leg should be immediately follow the right of the first square followed by your right left leg. So it is in a 1, 2, 3 motion like a dancing movement. From here your right foot comes across your left and into the center of the second square as the pattern is repeated in the opposite direction. Repeat the full length of the ladder. Next is 5 count drill that is stop, start with your feet hip width apart at the bottom of the ladder. Step out to the right of the first square with your right foot immediately followed by placing your foot left foot into the first square. Bring your right foot along the side, alongside your left in the first square and then step into the second square with your left foot immediately followed by the right. Count these first steps in as 1, 2, 3, 4 manner. Reverse the sequence by stepping out to the right of the third square with your left foot. Repeat for the full length of the ladder. Next is figure run that is the person has to run at different figures like that cons will be set where co uh, cons are used to mark the, the positions and he has to run in these figures especially this type of uh, activity is seen during the football and uh, rugby because to that is to tackle the, the, the ball each ball that is he can run in the figure like 7 or 8 or 9 that is especially it helps in dribbling in the soccer that is it depends on you can see that the picture in the that in the in the the picture where you can see cons are arranged like 7 or 8 or 9 next is agility drill t drills that is he has to run go, uh, forward and backward like a t now next is the sprint lateral shuffle that is set up a series of markers similar to the diagram. You can see the diagram there. Starting at the first marker, sprint to the second marker and side steps to the third marker. Then continue until the end. Rest and repeat from the other direction. Next type of is the box drills. It's here for these drills, two or three players can participate. It is mark out a square approximately 10 meters by uh, around by 10 meters and 10 into 10 square can be made. Then place a corner at the center of the square. This is the starting question. Now each corner is given to a number of or number or a name. The coach or training partner calls out a number or name at random and you must run to the corresponding corner and returns to the center. As a variation two players can be used and one player is can be labeled one and one other player can be labeled in another A or B. Then co ca coach can say two names, two numbers and first represent for A and second represent and this box drills can be done like this. Now other exercise, exercise for coordination are jumping jacks are the, skipping ropes or jump ropes are the, then squat thrust is the, box jump is the, Scott and press with the medicine ball and medicine ball is the medicine ball chest pass with the balance disc is the single leg lateral hop is the high knee drills are the 
burpees, mountain climbers, alternating dumbbell front raise, lying dumbbell rear lateral raise, box drills with the rings, reverse lunges, lunges with the balanced disc. These are the other exercises for coordination.